This is Hustle and Pro with Kelly Walker. Join Kelly as she talks sports with players, coaches, organizers, and entrepreneurs from Pee Wee League to Pro. Now here's your host, Kelly Walker. Welcome to Hustle and Pro. Today we are back talking soccer. Couldn't let too long go by without talking about soccer. So we have Eric Quill with us today. So nine seasons in the MLS. Then as a coach, he's led his teams to national titles and most recently a league title with Frisco's own North Texas Soccer Club. Welcome, Eric. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm excited to get to know you. So I do have some quick hits just to, to know a little bit about your sports um, personality. Who would you say is your favorite athlete? Just all time. Ooh, I think as a, if you asked me that question 15 years ago, it was Michael Jordan. Um, if you asked me that question today, um, I'd probably lean more on the soccer side. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm a big Messi fan. Mm-hmm. Me too. So it changes as the generations of time go. Sure. Those are, those are two good ones, though, that probably won't change a whole bunch more. What about, do you have a favorite team? Uh, Barcelona has always been one of my favorites. Um, English Premier League has always been Arsenal. Mm -hmm. So, but I'm a big follower of Barcelona. Just like the way they play. What's the farthest distance you've ever traveled to either play as a player or, um, coach or watch sports even? Uh, as a player, probably South Africa with, um, Kansas City Wizards in a preseason. Um, as a coach, I went to Australia once to recruit a player. So it was uh, both long flights, which I, I definitely remember not being fun. So I want to know about your background. Um, this, this might help answer it. Um, what sports did you play growing up, and what was your favorite to play? Ooh, so I was a multi, multi-sport athlete. My parents put me in everything, and I, did, I loved them all. So started with golf really early on, um, played baseball from, you know, t-ball on all the way through my junior year of high school. Played basketball from five to senior year of high school. Um, always played golf on the side, never never for the school, but just always loved the sport. And, uh, of course, soccer. Um, so those four. Where were you growing up that you could play all those sports for your high school? I grew up in Houston, okay. suburb of Houston. So we, we had this unique childhood where um, we had about seven really unbelievable athletes that grew up together and lived really around the corner from each other. So every day was spent, talk about the 10,000 hours of practice. Um, we, we definitely hit 10,000 at a very early age with how much we played after school and every day. Played everything? Everything, every sport under the sun. Um, we had this perfect little small field in between two houses that was not you know developed. So we used it as our it own yours. little ballpark. It yeah, was ours. Sandlot. All the kids met there, and, and it was just uh, it was a lot of fun. Looking back on it now, I I think that it had a large part to do with my development as a as an overall athlete. Playing all those different sports, you mean? Yep. And obviously that much time, but I think I think playing different sports throughout the year is huge. Um, when athletes focus one too early on one, I do think it does more harm than good. Usually, kind of backfires on you. Any of those seven or nine, however many friends you said, anybody we know. Uh, maybe uh, Kip Wells played, pitched in Major League Baseball for okay. maybe 11 years. Wow. Um, others made, you know, tr- made it to AAA, uh, a couple of, uh, NFL, um, players and, uh. Really? Yeah. So out of se- how many, seven you said? Nine, whatever? <laughs> it, it's probably That's around. That's pretty good odds. Yeah, no, it was, uh, you know, our high school was very, very good. And, and what athletic. high school is that? Elkins High School out of okay. Missouri City. So they won a sp- state baseball championship, actually two, um, James Loney came out of there, Dodgers first baseman. Um, so we had a we had a lot of baseball players come out of Holy cow. high school. That's a serious Sandlot group there. I That's know, pretty great. Okay, so I read that um, at University of Houston um, is where you is that where you got your undergrad or your degree from there? Yes, and that you also um, helped with the women's team soccer team there, right? Yep. And then you went on to play um, Clemson uh, for just one season, and then you ended up in the MLS for nine years including with a little bit of time with Dallas, right? With the yes. burn here. Yep. So what do you, what do you remember most and what are your favorite things about your time in the MLS? Uh, it was just a sort of a, it was, think about it now, it went really fast. I mean, it was uh, a lot of growth. I mean, I came in the league, I went to one semester at Clemson, like you said, and then was living on my own, trying to make it as a professional soccer player out of nowhere. And originally I had my head wrapped around going to school for four years um, 
And maybe, you know, wherever the wind took me after that was going to be the case. But then, you know, MLS came after the first semester and, and uh, you know, saw something in me and offered me a contract. And, and I wanted to play on a daily basis and wanted to make that jump now. And so just learning how to be on my own was a, was a big sort of adventure. Because you were young. I mean, only one year in. So that's nothing you set out for. They were recruiting you already your first year in school? Yeah, so we so I was part of the U-20 World Cup um, pool, and so that second semester of my freshman year, we were all going into residency, trained for the World Cup, and uh, and so I had to, you know, I, got, I took myself out of Clemson, and, you know, was, the plan was to reinstate the next year after the World Cup, and then in that time with the national team, uh, they came to a handful of us and said, you know, I think you guys are ready to take take the leap and and uh so yeah that they offered contracts up and I was one of the ones that was it's a big leap yeah I was told uh, my my parents were a little bit on the uh, you know my parents are definitely education first um people which is great kept me grounded and and uh so it was a little bit iffy um whether I, I should you know take this opportunity or go the conventional route of of that, Four years of college. that probably helps you now um, identify with your players who are making that huge decision, either themselves or if their family is still involved in the decision, because most of them are very young. We'll talk about that. But you probably get to understand that struggle in itself. No, you hit the nail on the head. I think that's probably maybe the Lord was putting me in this role to serve for these kids to, as an example um, that, you know, you can go back to school at later date to get your degree, which I did. Um, you can do it while you're playing um, if you're really disciplined. Um, there's lots of ways to, to make sure you're taking care of your education while pursuing your dream. Okay, so did I say that in the wrong order then? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. I was wondering if you were going the wrong if, on purpose. I wasn't going me. it on purpose. <laughs> so what order did, so, so U of H was not before Clemson? No. Okay, sorry. So I went to Clemson one semester and then went into the MLS for nine years. And when I stopped playing soccer, I moved back to Houston. And I took a job as an assistant with the women's program in Houston and started pursuing my, to finish my, my degree that I originally started at Clemson. Got it. Yeah, I didn't catch that the first time. Sorry, that's great. And so, also after the MLS, you've you've stayed in the Houston, or you were in Houston, I guess, till you got here, back up here to Frisco, correct? Just last year, you were with the Texans a little while. Uh, four years. Okay. I I'll, I played for the Texans growing up, so it was an organization okay. that developed me as a soccer player. So you played for the club, and then you came back. You were technical director, among other things, right? With Correct. them, and then um, also assistant coach with some of those U, um, like U15, 17, 19 levels. So I'm curious, um, the transition from being involved with the club team to those um, youth national teams, w was the transition difficult? Was there much difference at all when you are in those two types of levels and organizations? Uh, no, I mean, the game is the game. So from that standpoint, I was always comfortable. Um, it's just your dealing with a, the best of the best, right? Um, and a lot of, there's a, a lot of confidence with those players. Uh, and so just managing the the person um, and seeing, you know, helping them because these are all kids that are, that soccer wants to be, they want soccer to be their future mm -hmm. and they want to play the game at a professional level. So um, they're very honed in on where they want to be, who they want to be. Um, so helping them along the way to, to sort of reach their, their goals was the real uh, motivator and being able to work that level um, because it's so important to the U.S. Soccer Federation that we make these players the best they can be. So hopefully eventually one day we win a World Cup. Right. We're, get, we're getting, hopefully we're getting better. We are. We go back and forth sometimes it feels like, but I think we're getting there overall, right? We are. I think that if, if you look at results recently, maybe you question that, but I, there's not, it's not the players. It's not for lack of players. We got a lot of talent in the United States, and so um, different circumstances lead to results. But we, we got a lot of talent here in Texas, right? I mean, ton. between the, the guys you've developed in Houston and then now that, that you're working with here in the Dallas area, we kind of dominate some of those rosters, feels like. Yeah, no, Dallas is a, a hotbed, if you will, um, along with Southern California and, and Texas. And Texas and California have always sort of been uh, leaders in the amounts of, of players coming out of um, into those national team pools. 
Okay, so you were done in Houston, and then you made your way here to Frisco, specifically when you got named head coach of the North Texas Soccer Club. Is that right? That's correct. Okay, so for those who don't know, um, the USL League One, it was their inaugural season, just wrapped up. Um, Frisco's team, NTSC, North Texas Soccer Club, won the league. Uh, so tell me about the experience of, of coaching in uncharted territory in a new league like that. Uh, it, was, you know, it was a fun year. Um, I think everybody was sort of a student. Um, this first year in a lot of capacity. Uh, so, you know, learning the competition of the league, learning the travel, um, you know, the uh, the intensity of the league, the, you know, the ebbs and flows of, of managing players. And, and so it was just a, a really um, great learning year and experience for, for me personally and I know for our staff and the players, I feel, you know, really grew this last year. I think it was a great step by FC Dallas to, to, you know, f create this this team mm -hmm. um, because of the amount of t talent they have in the academy. So being able to bridge the gap um, between academy and first team was a really logical and important step for right. The club. It's kind of interesting that it wasn't there yet, with some of the other ways different professional organizations are structured. Um, so I loved it. I thought it was really interesting to see the players. Um, Go back. I like the going back and forth a little bit. And as an FC Dallas fan, seeing the roster coming below you, knowing what's about to come up, and or seeing your guys that didn't get in the first team game get to go play later that night or whatever with you. So I'm sure that was probably hard for you, but that was fun as a fan to watch that back and forth. So needless to say, the team on the field did great. You guys won the league, obviously, and um, you were named Coach of the Year. So congratulations Thank on you. that. And it was uh, kind of a landslide. So you got 53% of the votes for Coach of the Year this inaugural season. So what, what do you think it is about your leadership style that everybody, uh, your peers, voted for you? Uh, I, don't, I don't exactly know what it is. Um, I, think I'm, I think I'm very uh, – I ask a lot of players – I think I'm I'm very, uh, but I also I care a lot about players. I care about who they are as people, and and I care about our staff. And and I love being around people. I love collaborating with, with uh, our other coaches in the organization, allowing them to have their hands in, involved in, in what we're doing and the goals we set out for ourselves. So I and I think I do a pretty good job of painting the picture of a, of a, what a goal is to to achieve and and how we work towards that and and always remind them of that and. So, and I think the standard, you, every coach, you know, you want to set a standard for what your players should be putting out, mm -hmm. you know, from an effort and intensity and then making sure they're learning and making sure they're applying what they're learning. Um, so I feel like I'm kind of, I've told this to a bunch of people, I think I'm a, a mixture between my mom and dad. My, my mom was a school teacher for 30 plus years and my dad was a pastor um, who sort of built the church from ground zero and... Um, you know, so I feel like what I'm doing in life is sort of a combination of what both of them were to me and, and how I saw them in the community. So um, being able to teach the game is very important to me. I really enjoy trying to to create a vision and, and, and really teach um, young players how to play the game and, yeah. and what it should look like. And then managing people is, is the other side of it. And I think my dad always did a really good job of managing it. Um, the congregation and, right. and caring about getting a group to have a common belief system. Correct, and caring about and a lot of things happen outside of the church or off the field, so to speak. And you want to be able to care about people and know that they have somebody in you that um, they can they can trust and lean on and, and always give an honest opinion. Um, yeah, that it helps. And speaking of, so the average age of your players is just about nineteen and a half years old. So Correct. they probably lean on you. A lot, right? I mean, they're just figuring things out. Some of them are just getting out of school, high school, and um, especially if they were with the academy, they, they've only really known the soccer path so far, so they're leaning on you. So um, I was going to say, how do you get into that, into that mindset of connecting with them? But that answers some of that. Your parents' past and um, your path in soccer, right, mm -hmm. helps you just sort of have them buy into what you're selling them, I think, a little bit. Yeah, and all these experiences that I had as a player are very vivid in my mind and, and um, very fresh, so I can I can lend a fresh perspective as to, you know, what, they're like, what they may be going through. And it's not all, you know, it's not all roses, and, and there's, there's going to be ebbs and flows to everybody's sort of path and their trajectory and how they, when they make the first team, if they make the first team, what, you know, 
and knowing that it's okay to, it's okay. There's going to be moments where you're not going to be in great form or where you're not right. going to have a lot of confidence. And it's, and these are, I think once kids feel like that's normal and they're able to sort of, sort of relax and, and know that they can, you know, trust in, in a confidant and, and know that, you know, I have their best interest in mind. I think they tend to, you know, I, it sparks something in them, mm-hmm. you know, and it spark, ignites an ability to, to really go to the next level and, you know, with yeah. people. Do the work to get the development in. So, okay, I'll take the magnifying glass off of you. So then those young players, so um, Arturo Rodriguez, right? And Pepe? That's correct. Is that, am I saying Pepe right? Yeah. I never knew if it was Pepe or Pepe. Um, were some really fun ones to watch this season. So who else? Who, um, what other young guys are out there that we need to be watching for this next time around, I guess? Well, we definitely have one in Arturo's little brother, uh, David Rodriguez, is, is one that's an up-and-comer for sure. Um, he's going to, you know, I expect big things from him this year. Um, but there's, there's so many. There's so many you can choose from in our academy that we, we love. I mean, you know, Kevin Bonilla, Tanner Tessman, you know, Jerron Rayo. Nico Carrera, you know, there's a lot of guys that, Justin Che, there's a lot of kids that we, we look uh, at in our academy that we feel really have star power. And so, um, and then there's probably ones that we're not talking about right now that are, that are, uh, this that are on is their what way here. this culture creates is, you know, I think if I've seen anything and experienced anything is when your peers get, you know, accolades or get moved up to another level, it human nature takes over and it ignites something in you. If you really want that to be who you want, you know, that level, you want to make it to that level. So other people push people. And when you see your peers go up, it's human nature to sort of be motivated to, go get to do more, to yeah. go get it. Yeah. You know, so I'm sure there's players we're not talking about that are in our academy right now that will make it. Yep, that'll rise to the top. And now I'm a homer. I mean, I'm, I'm from Texas. I'm from Waco, um, but but lived here now nine years. So I'm a homer with FC Dallas, and I think their academy development and now with NTSC being in there, um, and I love FC Dallas, so I, I'm biased, but I think we're really good at that. Uh, what other areas of the country like are, are kind of good at that like we are? I don't know. I think there's a lot of people playing try to play catch-up with, with FC Dallas, and I think that, you know, obviously the schooling model here where players are able to train in the morning and go to school mm-hmm. is, a, is a huge factor. That way we can train along, you know, the first time, at uh, the same time as the first team where players are being integrated um, seamlessly. Right. It's, there's a huge value in that. Um, so seeing your peer go get, you know, go to the first team session, um, you know, and then come back with, you know, a large amount of confidence. Right. And now, is that, a, is that an FISD relationship thing that is, a, is an important part of making that piece work? I think it is. Yeah. Yes, for sure. I mean, I think that they've done a really great job, and I think so. Other cities around the country are trying to implement um, a schooling piece that you know allows it to go hand in hand with with their academy, because um, you, tr- you need training hours. You need tr- important training hours that allows you to, and especially the training hours with the level level above, um, makes makes a world of difference. And so, um, I just know that people are taking notice of, and you can once you see product and you see, you know, the amount of homegrown players that FC Dallas is signing, you know, people are going to start to question what what are they doing over there, right? And start to look over the fence, kind of deal. And uh, so this is a good place to look over the fence because yeah, we're doing something right for sure. Okay, so that brings me to my last subject. I keep saying Frisco Zone, you're moving. So NTSC is moving home base, you know, to um, Globe Life Park. So you said you were a baseball guy when you were growing up too. So um, I'm, I bet that's an exciting thing for you. Have you gotten to spend time out there with, with seeing the transition happen, the fields and everything? I have not. Well, we went had a media day there um, with the XFL team, uh, um, coaching staff. So it was, and it was going under renovation. Mm-hmm. Um, but I remember being a fan inside the baseball stadium, watching my buddy Kip Wells pitch. Um, for the White Sox against the Rangers, and so you know, it's just it's unique. I've I've been to a lot of you know major league baseball parks, and it's it's fun to to sort of s- see the vision of soccer being played inside of there, and and what it could be. Um, I love the area. I think it's got a unique um, feel from the surroundings outside of it. Allows for a great fan experience. Um, I think we're gonna we're gonna touch a market that maybe um, has been out of, out of reach in some ways. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm really hopeful that, you know, we can, our players get out in the community and really sort of stranglehold this, this, you know, and unite the, the city of Arlington and, yeah. and 
allow for them to come and support soccer, which is what we want. But logistically, you're not going to, how are you going to not miss that training integration time, right? Are you still guys? No, gonna... we're still going to train here okay. in Frisco. So you're still going to train here and this will still be your day-to-day facility, Correct. but your games will be played out there? Correct. Oh, okay, good. Yeah. I mean, I knew games were out there, but I kind of wondered, I thought you guys can't lose that, that no system no that's 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 in place and we know the value of that that's not going away it's you know maybe we have a, a training session the day before a game in arlington for the you know field purposes but every day it's going to be same thing integration with first team academy um all being under the same roof well that's exciting it's cool i mean i i've seen those renderings from media today like you said um it's crazy that they're you know i can't remember i guess it's third base dugout it's all getting kind of pushed back so that that soccer field or football field um, can fit lengthwise and then bringing in the stands. And so it'll take some getting used to. Mm-hmm. I am anxious to get out there and see it, you know, live and in person and how they're going to make all the configurations work. But it'll be great, I'm sure. No, it will be. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm sold. I saw the rendering as well. So it's, it's going to be an interesting time and moment for the club, um, but one that I think we're all kind of excited for. And, yeah, I mean, to, to play at a stadium of that, that size and yeah. and what they're doing to it to make it sort of an intimate experience for the for the game of soccer mm-hmm. is really really attractive. And I think did they say that some of those um, like the locker rooms and dugouts are going to be used? I mean, I know the one dugout's getting moved, but just to be able to the history and especially as a baseball fan to be able to be in there and kind of down in the bones where some of those players have been and that was their their ballpark home for so long that's cool i know i'm gonna be checking around every corner for some some swag you know you're not an astros fan though are you oh yes i oh, am oh gosh well <laughs> well hopefully you will at least uh respect the rangers while you're there i know and um maybe you'll come to and like them a little bit being in there they're always my home. second favorite good okay all right well thanks eric for jumping over here i know um that you guys are busy wrapping up this successful season and looking forward. I know you probably have a lot of development and recruiting already on your plate. So thanks for taking the time to come chat with us. Anytime. Appreciate you having me. And thanks for listening to Hustle and Pro. Don't forget to subscribe however you're listening us to us today on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, or even on our YouTube channel.